Hello everyone, this is Dr. Sin, your board certified OBGYN, national speaker, and Volvar Skin Specialist. Thank you for joining Unveiling the Private Face. And as you guys come in, please like and share. We have some very interesting things to talk about tonight that I think you guys will enjoy. So once again, as you come in, please like and share. I thought today would be great. Hi, Renee. I thought today would be great just to give a little trivia as we wait for others to come in. So I'm going to ask you guys, who was the first female physician in the United States? If anyone knows, please put that in the um, comments. The first female physician in the United States. If you know the answer, put that in the comments. All right. Thanks for joining, Wilbo. We'll try to wait for others to join. Each, each week I'm here on Thursdays at 7 p.m. Um, we'll start out with a little trivia just for us to give others time to join. So today's trivia question is, who is the first female physician in the United States? So if you know the answer, place that in the comment box. Usually, I talk about the private face. The private face is what most people call the vulva or the vulvar vaginal area. I like to call it the private face because more and more women are realizing that this area can be just as beautiful as their public face. But today we're going to do things a little bit differently. And we have a very serious topic for today that I think is much needed. So as you guys come in, hi, Jerry, thanks for joining. Thank you. Hi, Tia, Courtney. Oh, Jerry has the answer, Elizabeth Blackwell. Yes, ma'am. She was the first female physician in the United States. And she became a physician in 1849. And she started the New York Infirmary for Women and Children in 1857. So big ups for Elizabeth Blackwell for being the first female physician in the United States. Good job, Jerry. All right, as you guys join, please like and share. Please like and share as you guys join. So once again, normally with unveiling the private face, we talk about maintenance of the private face, things we can do to optimize the skincare and the beauty of the private face. But we're gonna get a little serious tonight because uh, this topic is important. There's been a lot in the media in the last few days, the last few months, um, in reference to black women dying in pregnancy or dying while giving uh, birth to their child or shortly afterwards. So it's something that we need to talk about. It's something that we have to educate the community about. So today we are discussing racial disparities in obstetrical care, okay? Next week, we're gonna do disparities in gynecologic care. But first I wanted to talk about obstetrics because um, it's all in the news and it it's very disheartening, at least it is for me. So I'm sure for my women watching that they feel the same way. So I wanna make sure that you're well-educated so that you can educate others on the things that we can do to advocate for ourselves. Things we can do to try to do our part in eradicating the disparities in healthcare. So we're gonna talk about the maternal mortality rate. So the first thing is important for you guys to understand exactly what that is. So maternal mortality rate is death caused or aggravated by pregnancy. Okay. It doesn't mean that you happen to be pregnant and you died, you know, so if you were in a car accident or something of that nature, that does not count towards 
maternal mortality rate. It is deaths caused or aggravated by pregnancy. So in the United States, in 2018, our maternal deaths were 17.4 deaths per 100,000 live births. Okay, so some may say, well, is that good, is that bad? When we look at a global picture from the 1990s up to 2015, the maternal mortality rate has decreased by 44%. Now, in the United States, we're not doing as great. We got some work to do. So in the past 100 years, our mortality rate has actually increased. So 100 years ago, we had 12 maternal deaths per 100,000 live births. And in 2018, we were at 17.4 maternal deaths per 100,000 live births. Now, there's a lot of factors that are causing this, but it's something that is very serious. Hey, Shanikia, thanks for joining. You guys, please like and share as you come in. So here's my question to you guys. What is the greatest risk factor for maternal death? Whatever you think it may be, can you put that in the chat? What do you think is the greatest risk factor for maternal death? What do you guys think? Anything, just put it out there. Want to see what your thoughts are. What do you think the greatest risk factor is that may cause a woman to die in pregnancy? No hitters? All right, guys. Hypertension. That's a good one. Very good. Anything else? So this is very serious. The greatest risk factor for death in pregnancy in the United States of America is being black. I'm going to say that again. The greatest risk for death in pregnancy in the United States of America is being black. So clearly this is something that we need to talk about. Now, in 2017, all states st had a, they developed a standardized checkbox for maternal deaths on death certificates. So this allowed us the ability to really know what our maternal death rate was. So when we looked at the data from 2018, we found that black women are two and a half more often dying because of maternal death than our white counterparts. Our maternal death rate is 37.1 compared to our counterparts who are at 14.7. 37.1 compared to 14.7. So why is this? is multifactorial, okay? So what I wanna do this evening is talk about some of the reasons why and what we can do to help eradicate this problem. So the number one reason why is that women of color, black women, uh, also Native American and Native Alaskan women are less likely to have access to quality prenatal care. Only 87% of black women in the United States who are in the reproductive age have insurance. Only 87%. More than 25% of black women meet their birth attendant, that is the person who's going to deliver their baby in this most special moment. They meet this person for the first time at time of delivery compared to 18% with our counterparts. 
25% compared to 18%. African-American women have a lower frequency of prenatal visits and they seek prenatal care later. Now, some may assume, oh, this is because they're not taking prenatal care seriously. They just come when they feel like it. And a lot of the times that's not the case. You may have a few out there like that. But from my experiences, when I see um, a young lady in triage who's coming in with a problem and they have an established prenatal care, the number one reason that I'm hearing is that they don't have insurance. So I say, well, hey, have you applied for Medicaid? Yeah, yeah I've done the application. This is what they tell me. They've done the application, but it hasn't been approved yet. So when they call various medical offices to get in to be seen, they will not see them until they have established that they have insurance even though their Medicaid is pending. So this puts a lot of women at a major disadvantage. They want to see the doctor. They care about their health. They care about the well-being of the child that they're carrying. But they no one will see them because they don't have insurance. They've applied for Medicaid as they're supposed to if they don't have insurance. Nine times out of 10, they're going to qualify for Medicaid during pregnancy. But many offices, not all, but many offices will not allow them to establish care until they have the insurance. So this automatically puts these women at a disadvantage. So when we hear or you hear that, oh, they're just going to the doctor really late or they hardly go to their appointments, That's something to uh, really think about and take note of. Also, a lot of women who are African-American, who are in a lower socioeconomic status, have jobs that really don't allow them to take off of work. So there's always this fear of losing their job. And here they are that they're pregnant. So that's another concern, another issue that's contributing to them missing appointments. So we always have to keep all the factors in mind when we're looking at the data. Because usually the reason for things are are multifactorial. It's usually not just one reason. So what is the solution? What can we do to combat the fact that Women of color have less access to quality prenatal care. This is not meant to be a political talk, but the number one thing we can do is vote. If you want to make sure that everyone has access to prenatal care, you have to make sure that everyone is able to obtain health care, period. And how you do that is you vote, not just at the federal level, but also at the local level. Once again, this is not meant to be a political talk, but it's real. And if we want to get this maternal mortality rate down, then we have to start taking more drastic measures. The other thing we need to do is educate. We need to educate our our young women about the importance of prenatal visits. And we need to also educate them that even if you don't have insurance, even if you cannot make an appointment because you don't have the insurance yet, if you are bleeding and you know that you're pregnant, if you're having pain and you know that you're pregnant, you need to be evaluated. So if that means going to the emergency room, you need to go to the emergency room because sometimes that situation can be life-threatening. So I want patients to be more concerned about their life and less concerned about the bill that may come with that ER visit. So if you are pregnant and you have not established care yet, and if you start having severe abdominal pain, if you start bleeding, if you develop an elevated temperature, if you have fever or chills, go to the emergency room. 
Okay. So does anyone have questions about the, the first reason why we have such disparities in obstetrical care? Once again, we're going to vote and we're going to educate. Now, the second reason is increased susceptibility to certain health conditions. For example, high rates of obesity, or as Denise mentioned, hypertension. Okay, so preeclampsia and eclampsia. So preeclampsia is what the old folks used to call toxemia of pregnancy. That's when you get the elevated blood pressures, you start spilling protein in your urine. Some women may develop a lot of swelling, things of that nature. That's preeclampsia. Or eclampsia. Eclampsia is when you have seizures in pregnancy. Okay, so preeclampsia and eclampsia are 60% more common in African American women and also more severe. Even though it's 60% more common in African American women, they are less likely to be hospitalized. Okay, so here's my next question. What is the number one cause of maternal mortality? Any takers? Can you guys put something in the chat? What do you think is the number one cause of maternal deaths? you have an opinion, it's okay to put it in the chat. The number one cause of maternal mortality in the United States is cardiovascular conditions. They represent one third of pregnancy related deaths. So it doesn't correlate for African American women to be 60% more likely to develop preeclampsia and eclampsia. And we know that falls into those conditions that are the number one cause for maternal mortality for us to be less likely to be hospitalized. That doesn't add up. So what's the solution? The first thing the first part of the solution starts at the hospital level. And it starts with standardized protocols. So many hospitals have put in place standardized protocols. It doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter if you have insurance, you don't have insurance. For example, if you come into labor and delivery triage and your blood pressure is in the severe range, they have a certain time frame in which they are required to take a second blood pressure. If it's still in this severe range, they have a defined time period to give the first medication to bring that blood pressure down. So there are set protocols. These protocols are pre-written. Um, they are in the system where all they have to do, for example, is to initiate the severe hypertension protocol. And this is a way for us to help make sure that all women are getting the, the same care. So that's one thing that is happening. It's not happening everywhere, but it's starting to happen in many hospital settings. The other part of that solution you know, we talked about um, in 2017 where they had the standardized checkbox on the death certificates. That has allowed us to look at maternal mortality rates at a state level, even at a hospital level. And we need to go as far as looking at it at individual provider levels. Because this is such a serious problem, we have to do more when it comes to finding solutions. The next thing that we need to do in reference to this is patient education. All right. 
prepping for delivery doesn't start at the first prenatal visit. It starts preconception. So if you know or someone in your family has cardiac disease, they have high blood pressure, you need to make sure they're doing everything that they need to do prior to conception to optimize the outcome during pregnancy. When you go in for your first prenatal visit, it's important that you give a complete personal and family history. Even if you're not asked, you volunteer that information, especially if heart disease runs in your family, especially if you've ever had any member of your family to, who, to experience a heart attack before the age of 40. That information needs to be shared with your providers. Also, we need to educate our patients about signs and symptoms that may uh, point to a cardiac event, okay? So if you're pregnant, now it's common that we get a little tired in pregnancy, that we can get a little winded if we're doing too much walking up and down the stairs, things of that nature. But if your fatigue becomes extreme for you, you need to be evaluated. If you are having shortness of breath and you're not doing anything, you need to be evaluated. If you have chest pain, if you have any visual changes, if you develop abdominal pain, especially in the right upper quadrant, it's important for you to go in and be seen. If you call to speak to the doctor's office where you're receiving care and you're told to just lie down or everything would be okay, I'm telling you, if you're having any of those symptoms, you need to go in to be seen. If they do not allow you to come into the office for that day, you go to the hospital. You do not have to ask for permission to go to the hospital. So if you're having any of those symptoms, or if there's someone in your family who's experiencing those things, please have them to go to the hospital. Also, follow-up appointments. A lot of us feel that once we have the baby that everything is okay, we're good, baby's out, we should be fine now. And that's not the case. When it comes to maternal deaths, one third of them happen during pregnancy a third of them the day of delivery or within a week of birth, and then the rest are up to one year after delivery. So it's extremely important to keep your follow-up appointments. It's also extremely important that even if you develop those symptoms and you've delivered, you've already delivered, that you still go in to be seen. Women who've had preeclampsia, eclampsia, they're at increased risk to develop what we call cardiomyopathy, and that's life-threatening, okay? And how they present, even after delivery, is that fatigue, that shortness of breath, that cough, things of that nature. If you're experiencing any of those things, or you have a family member or a friend who's having that, please have them to go in to be seen. If you had any issues with elevated blood pressures during your pregnancy. Let's say you weren't preeclampsia, you just had what we call gestational hypertension, or if you have chronic hypertension. It is not okay for you to wait to go in for your six week postpartum visit. You need to be seen at least one week after delivery. You should be going in for a blood pressure check. Sometimes this is not happening, okay? But it's important for this to happen. So if you're seeing those things, please make sure that you're going in to be seen. Oh, I have to scroll down here. I apologize, Denise. I see where you put cardiac arrest. You are correct. Adrian, I tell my patients that you know your body better than anyone else. If it doesn't feel right, it probably isn't right. Gone to the hospital. That is the truth. Thanks, Adrian. I really appreciate you putting that in there. And just so you guys know, Adrian is a labor and delivery nurse. So she knows this information firsthand. So if you've had issues, blood pressure in pregnancy, maybe you didn't even need medication, 
but you had gestational hypertension and you get discharged from the hospital, if they say to you, oh, I'm going to see you back in six weeks, you say, no, ma'am, I'd like to be seen next week. Okay. It is important that you're seen at least one week after delivery. Your surveillance, according to the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, should continue for 12 weeks after delivery. So you have to be cognizant of these symptoms and what may occur for that far after delivery. Also, after delivery, if you feel that your wound is not healing well, if you develop fever and chills, anything of that nature, it's imperative that you come in to be seen. So, once again, when it comes to increased susceptibility to certain health conditions, the solution is standardized protocols, which are being done at the hospital, and patient education. So the last reason why we have such disparities in health care is institutional racism in society and in the health care system. So I'm going to give you guys some facts. This is research that has been done. This is not just Dr. Sin's opinion, okay? Black serving hospitals provide lower quality maternity care. 75% of black patients give birth at these hospitals. Research examining implicit racial biases in the healthcare setting what it has shown is that African-American doctors show no preference between patients of color versus white patients, white women. White female doctors, they do a little better than white male doctors. Studies have shown that white male providers show significant implicit preference for the white female patient. So that's just something to be aware of, okay? African American patients are less likely to receive cardiovascular therapies of proven benefits and have worse outcomes after such procedures. That's real. Okay. So what is the solution? How do we combat this? Can you guys still hear me? My little video on the side um, went down on my computer. So if you can still hear me, please type yes in the chat. Can someone type yes in the chat if you can still hear me? Can you guys still hear me? All right, well, I'm gonna keep going. So the solution is standardized protocols at the hospital level. The hospital healthcare systems need to, thanks Cheryl, I appreciate that. The hospital systems need to do a better job with standardized assessments, okay? So if we have the protocols, we need to look to see who's not following those protocols and make sure that that's being addressed. Also, there needs to be more effort at having a more diverse staff and physicians that are consistent with the makeup of the patients who are being treated. We have this thing called distrust in the African American community when it comes to um, health care. And uh, that's been the situation for hundreds of years. And sometimes that distrust works against us. And I'm going to give you an example. You have a lady who maybe had a difficult delivery, um, difficult C-section, and she's told by the doctor that it would not be good for her to get pregnant again. 
because it may increase her risk for maternal death. Because of our history, a lot of times we are not ready to receive that information because of the distrust. So we see some patients saying, oh, they gonna tell me I can't have babies, I can have babies, and they go ahead and get pregnant again. And sometimes the outcome is poor. Sometimes the outcome is a maternal death. And the patient was counseled about that on the front end. So what I'm saying, if you're ever told that it would not be a good idea for you to get pregnant again because you may die, I want you to take that seriously. If you do not trust the person giving you that information, please seek a second opinion. Anytime counsel is given in that way, do not take it lightly. Please seek a second opinion prior to going ahead and getting pregnant anyways. Okay, so at the patient level, what can we do? How do we advocate for ourselves? I hear a lot, you know, we look at Judge Hatchett and her son um, lost his wife in pregnancy. She had a C-section and um, after delivery complained of abdominal pain, uh, became pale, it was 10 hours later before she was taken back into the operating room and she had hemorrhaged and she died on the table. And what was said was, they're not hearing me. I'm not being heard. We hear that time and time again. I'm not being heard. I'm not taken seriously. So what do you do if you're in that situation or your loved one is in that situation? You're even in the hospital setting and you're not being heard or you're outpatient and you're not being heard. If you're outpatient and you feel that your doctor is not taking you seriously, you go get a second opinion. If you're outpatient and you're having any of those symptoms that I went over, you go to the hospital. So if you're in the hospital and you feel like, let's say the nurse who's taking care of you is not really listening to what you're saying or really addressing your concerns. What do you do? Well, there's a charge nurse on every unit. You can ask to speak to the charge nurse. If you feel the same way, you can ask to speak to the house supervisor. The other thing that you can do, you can ask to speak to the physician. You can ask for your physician to come to your bedside. Also, you can get a second opinion from another physician while you're in the hospital. It is okay to ask for that. Do not feel that, uh, don't worry about someone assuming that you're having a quote unquote attitude merely because you're advocating for yourself. You're not there to make friends. Now I'm not suggesting screaming, cursing, things of that nature, but your number one responsibility is to take care of yourself and to take care of your child. So those are the steps that you can take, okay? So if you are not getting the response that you feel that you need, ask for the provider to come to your bedside and talk to them. If you still feel that you're not getting what you want, of course you could do a second opinion. And at most hospitals, there is a, a, a patient advocate. And you can actually speak to the patient advocate who will advocate on your behalf, okay? Some women have doulas. And these are people who come to the hospital with you to help you through the stressful part of uh, pregnancy. They're not doing your delivery or anything of that nature, but they're there to relieve your stress. They're there to advocate for you with the staff. Sometimes women can be so stressed out that they're unable to really um, communicate how they feel. Sometimes it's stress, sometimes it's fear. That doula can advocate on your behalf. So those are some of the things that you can do. All right. Now, does anyone have questions? Any questions out there?
All right, Tony. She's a doula. Tony LJ. Tony, what city are you in? What what city are you in? Tony LJ. She is a doula. Okay. Well, I know we weren't talking about the private face tonight, but I felt that this information was extremely important. If anyone has questions, please put them in the chat. If you think of questions later, oh, thanks, Tony, for giving that. Oh, Murfreesboro. All right. You guys know I used to practice in Nashville, Tennessee, in, and in Smyrna, which is right outside of Murfreesboro. So please put it in the chat. Um, any questions that you may have. If I don't answer your questions tonight, I will be looking back on this information and, and try to get in there to answer your questions. Okay, so next week we will be discussing disparities in healthcare when it comes to gynecology. So there's a lot to talk about in reference to that. So thanks for joining me tonight. Once again, I am Dr. Sin your OBGYN. I am a national speaker and vulvar skin specialist. Granted, I love talking about the private face, but I'm a board certified OBGYN and sometimes we have to talk about other things. So join me next week, Thursday at 7 p.m. and we are going to discuss disparities in healthcare part two, gynecology. Thanks. I appreciate all of you guys joining me this evening and you have a great evening. Good day. Thanks so much.